Hi, this is Rob Hawley from the Fremont Peak Observatory. In this lecture, we're going to talk about viewing the solar eclipse with your eyes. If you haven't seen my series on photographing solar eclipses, you might want to review the intro. That defines some terms that I will be using and introduces who I am. A total solar eclipse is a unique experience, one that's difficult to explain to someone who's not seen one. Eclipses are short, and it's not a time to be thinking on your feet. What I'm trying to do in this video is to try to give you an idea of things you should be looking for to try to get the maximum experience. But first a safety warning. Looking at the sun is dangerous, especially looking at the sun magnified as we're going to talk about in a minute. Don't do it. Just don't. It will be okay after totality to linger on the sun with your naked eyes for a couple moments, but not with binoculars. But any other time, risk your vision. For more information, see the Exploratorium videos later in this presentation. Watching an eclipse with your eyes means you don't have to bring a lot of equipment. But there is one thing you're going to want to bring that we'll talk about in a moment, and there's some other things that you might consider bringing to enhance your experience. Well before the eclipse, you're going to want to purchase some eclipse glasses. The go-to place is Rainbow Symphony. They have the best. These fit over your glasses or directly on your head and allow you to look at the sun. They are safe and designed just for this purpose. I've heard of other alternatives that might work, but these are the safest. I viewed eclipses both with and without magnification. In my opinion, viewing it with magnification gives you a much richer experience. But going back to the safety warning, you will need to know when you can and cannot look at the sun without your solar filters that we'll be talking about in a moment. The easiest way to magnify is to use a pair of binoculars. These are mine. They're image stabilized, which is pretty fancy. If your hands are steady, you can get by with others. If you choose to use binoculars, then having proper solar filters for them is even more important, as you'll be viewing the sun magnified. Fortunately, Rainbow Symphony also makes filters for binoculars, or you can make them yourself using botter film. One other thing you might consider is to wear an eye patch over one eye. I started doing this after the 2008 eclipse when I made the mistake of looking at C2 too early. While viewing the 99% eclipse sun for about a half a second wasn't dangerous, it did leave a bright spot which lasted for about five minutes. Kind of a bummer if the eclipse is only two. I had to work around it. Since then I've always protected one eye. This also means the eye is dark adapted, so when you take the eye patch off, you get a much richer view of the corona. Here are two URLs you might want to check out before going to the eclipse. The Exploratorium site has all sorts of useful information. If you have young kids, then you might consider building a projection viewer instead of using glasses, and the bottom URL gives you instructions on how to do that. It takes about 70 minutes from the first contact to the second contact, and during that time, I will admit, it's like watching grass grow. To entertain yourself, one of the things that you might do is to bring something with with little holes in it that'll project little crescents of the sun. In March we asked to borrow the spaghetti colander and the cooks thought we were a little nuts until they saw the result. The other thing is to remind yourself that those that didn't travel to the eclipse site are only seeing what you're seeing now and not what you're about to see. The interesting visual experience begins about two minutes before the eclipse. and There's a number of things you should be looking for. First, shadows will start becoming very sharp. Next, start looking for the shadow of the moon. This is going to be easier to do if you're in the west. In the east, the sun's going to be much higher and the shadow's going to be much more diffuse. Next, look for shadow bands. True confessions, I've never seen them. Look around and see what the animals are doing. In 2001, the cows started heading home to be milked, even though it was the middle of the afternoon. Finally, notice the temperature. If you're further east, the eclipse is going to happen later in the day, and you should notice a noticeable drop in temperature during totality. Things happen pretty fast, so I've taken screenshots from my video on Svalbard and highlighted things that you should be looking for. First notice how the leg of the tripod has a fuzzy shadow. Well that's normal, because usually the sun is not a point source. The rays from various parts of the sun come in at different angles, and consequently each cast different shadows, all of which are fuzzed together just checking the camera. As totality approaches, the shadow gets sharper because the angular size of the sun gets smaller. Also, we should start seeing the moon's shadow. That, after all, is what causes the eclipse. A little closer now, 
The shadow is getting sharper and the sky is getting darker on the right. We're now within 20 seconds of totality. Look how sharp the shadow is now and look how distinct the shadow of the moon is. Those of you on the west coast can try putting out a sheet and see if you see shadow bands. I've never seen them, although many people did in Svalbard. The moon's shadow is now hiding the sun. Totality has begun. Notice the shadows have completely disappeared on the ground, and the moon's shadow is very distinct in the sky. The August 2017 eclipse only lasts for two minutes, so therefore it's important for you to think a little bit about what you want to look at, and there's a lot to look at. I'm going to focus on two areas. First, what you can see unaided, and second, what you can see with binoculars. In Russia in 2008, I didn't bring binoculars, and so I was ended up looking at the eclipse just with my eyes, and using a camera only for wide angle. Whether you use binoculars or not, it's important for you to look around. Here's some things to look at. First, notice along the horizon. You should still see a little bit of light. After all, you're in the moon's shadow. Those parts of the sky aren't. Many people say to take a moment and look for planets. In Russia, Mercury and Venus were visible. On the west coast in 2017, Mars will be above the sun and Mercury below it. Both are likely going to be dim. Venus will be about 20 degrees further in the direction of Mars. As the sun travels to the east coast, the orientation of the planets will change. Mars will now be on the right, Mercury on the left, Venus on the extreme right, after C3, turn 90 degrees to your left and look southeast. You may be able to see Jupiter. The corona is perhaps the most unique feature of a total solar eclipse. After all, prominences can be viewed with a hydrogen alpha scope. The corona is only visible during an eclipse. You can get a satisfying view of the corona with just your naked eye. However, I think binoculars will do better. The shape of the corona varies greatly from eclipse to eclipse. Here are some examples. My photographs from 2001 show an almost uniform corona with few bright flares, although some heavily processed pictures do show more detail. In 2015, there were a couple of bright flares. There was also a lot of visible turbulence in the corona. As I remarked on the audio track in 2016, the corona was the most unique that I've seen, with delicately curving structures and a bright flare. The 2006 corona featured two flares on opposite sides forming almost a square. Unless your eyes are incredibly better than mine, you're going to need binoculars to see prominences. Prominences are the other neat feature of the eclipse. You can see prominences in a hydrogen alpha scope, but there they're pretty dim. Here they will be the brightest phenomenon. For you binocular users, make note, there is a safety issue involved in looking at the magnified sun. We'll talk more about that when we get to the discussion of C3. As I describe in my series on photographing solar eclipses, Cameras don't really do eclipses very well, and so the pictures I'm going to be presenting now are not going to be a good representation of what you're going to see in your eyes. They're going to emphasize the prominences, which is useful for this discussion, but remember when you're looking at them yourself, you're going to see corona at the same time. The challenge in doing justice to the prominences is to pick out all of the unique features. So for this picture, it shows a disconnected prominence. A small piece of prominence is broken off and is heading out into space as well as a couple of more normal prominences. Here's a photo from Easter Island in 2010. In a typical eclipse, you will only be able to see prominences right after C2 and right before C3. However, if the prominences are especially large, then you can see them throughout the entire eclipse. Let me magnify this image by a factor of two. Notice the loop. Prominence loops are one of the interesting features to look for. Here's a photo from 2006. Notice the prominence that looks like a hand with a raised finger. This was visible in the viewfinder of my camera, so it would be easily visible in binoculars. Finally, this one from a ship off the coast of Liberia in Africa. This was a unique eclipse. The eclipse was short, and consequently the moon was small. It just covered the surface of the sun. As a result, prominences were visible throughout the entire eclipse. I got so wrapped up in looking at the prominences, I actually forgot to look at the corona. Finally, the last thing to look for. And you can do this with your naked eye, or with binoculars. The sun is like a big bar magnet. And like any bar magnet, it has magnetic lines of force. You're probably all familiar with the simple science experiment where you make the lines of force visible using iron filings. Well, the lines of force are sometimes visible in the crone as well. Not every time, but there's something to look for. You can see them here on the top and the bottom of the sun. For those of you looking at the eclipse through binoculars, it's back to safety. 
The eclipse is about to end, and you need to know what to look for so you can protect yourself. When you see one side of the sun covered with red, that's the warning. It's time to look away right now. The bright surface of the sun is about to be exposed. Put your binoculars down and enjoy the diamond ring with the pure visual observers. It's okay to look at it for a second or two, but I wouldn't do it for longer than that. The danger to your eyes is growing second by second. So that brings us to the end of our video on watching a solar eclipse. Remember, this is going to be an experience that you'll remember for the rest of your life. The more detail you can pick out from it, the better and richer the experience is going to be. By now, I suspect you're wondering where to go to see the eclipse. Well, I addressed that question in part five of my series on photographing solar eclipses. That section talks about the weather prospects at various sites. Enjoy the eclipse. It will be an experience you will remember forever.